So, welcome everybody to um, another episode of um, Software Tech Doom Stream, uh, this time around in, in English. And um, I'm sitting here with two, two guests, actually live. Um, so, Hannes, do you want to say a few words about yourself and what you do? Yeah, hi, I'm Hannes. Uh, most of the time I'm consultant. We have a small consulting company that is like say, seven years old and currently I'm working at Chibo and help them to become a more excellent engineering company. Rob, what about you? Hi, uh, I'm Robert. Uh, I, work, I work as an engagement manager for a company called uh, Equal Experts. It's a consultancy company that uh, helps clients with extremely complicated problems by putting teams of um, super experienced, super senior consultants together to support companies in uh, delivering their goals. Great. Um, and yeah, I have to apologize because at the bottom of the screen, in the stream, it says Ewald Wolf. And I'm not going to give you any details about why this is the case. There are some complex technical uh, reasons for that. And I'm actually uh, quite happy that, that we're able to do the stream today. So such a live or, um, setup is always a little bit complicated. So it has to do something with that. Um, so we are going to talk about ex uh, engineering excellence, and and uh, I called uh, the uh, this episode encouraging uh, engineering excellence because I like alliterations. All alliterations are off, awful, awful, excellent, whatever. So um, we. Yeah, so we we just got a got a comment about how the microphone is not working from the audience here. So really, the the speakers are not working, and that's a different problem. So and and they are actually not attached to to the mix. I'm 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 sorry about that. So um, where were we? Okay. So how did this start? How did they, did this discussion actually start? Okay, I'll try to speak up. I hope I don't boom on the internet now. Well, this started roughly six weeks ago when Christian asked me to write something down about junior, professional, senior, and possibly lead engineers. And I thought in my career, I've done that before, um, and I tried to find an easy way out by just looking at my former posts and do some carbon copy and paste on that. And on the other hand, I felt a bit awkward with the task because it felt like, oh, again, I have to put people into drawers and decide who is in which drawer, so I wasn't really too motivated to do that. And when I, the other thing I always do is I write something in a Google Doc. And I started this Google Doc with the chapter why. Why should I actually do it? Why should a company actually care about putting people into drawers? And then I thought a bit and I said, okay, maybe it's about giving feedback or, or starting a discussion about excellency my first sentence in the why was something like, well, if you don't care for that in a company, if you don't think about it, if you don't do anything about it, then you shouldn't be too astonished if the outcome is just average. And I read my own sentence, and somehow I then caught a bit fire and more fire and started writing down. Soon I had like five pages of it, and then I thought I should talk to some people who are more into the subject than myself, and I asked you two guys, I asked like 10 other people or 20 other people that I know from companies, and they all pitched in. And so this whole document grew. Then we started our discussion group on Fridays where we have these kind of discussions um, and put thoughts together. Now it's out in the internet as open source. And we will link to that in, in the description of, of the video and this episode. Um, and yeah, they're pretty much... I guess it sums it up, right? So, um, and and the reason why I really wanted to do this stream is because um, I enjoyed that those conversations that we had on Fridays, and that is the reason why I thought, well, we open up the the discussion and you know have that that conversation in 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 a public place. Um, so, what do we mean with like excellence? Well, I think Rob, you had the best definition because that's what we are talking about. So we should rather define it, right? Uh, yeah. So instead of reinventing what's already out there, um, you if you... Could you 
Sure. Um, instead of redefining what's already out there, uh, when you go through the internet, the best description for me uh, and the simplest to understand was there are two parts to excellence. One is the ability to perform as an individual or as a team, and the other is the ability to deliver. So you can be great at what you do, but if you don't deliver, that wouldn't be considered excellence. If you think of a, a runner, you can run really fast, but if you don't win races, you might not be considered excellent. And so those two things, I think, are at the heart of excellence. Uh, Johannes, you had some extra things that you added that I also think. Yeah, but I thought uh, it's also about the ability of adapting and learning. Because if you, if, you, if you always perform and always win, you might not notice that something is off and that, that you could learn something new. Or if you don't perform and don't excel in what you do, you could still learn to do it. So I think it's also about learning. So excellence somehow connects to learning. I'm yeah, even though, that, even though, I mean, it sort of seems that there are two different opinions, right? So there's the one opinion that says, okay, I'm able to do something. And then there's the other one that says, okay, I'm also able to adapt and, and to learn. And I think both make some sense. So I'm actually fine with both of them. So we could probably continue to the next question. Um, th there's one other thing I'd like to add. It's great to be excellent one-off, but the key is to do that on a sustainable way so that you can be excellent all the time and that's part of this adaptability and learning you can't just what you do today to be excellent is probably not what you need to do over time and so looking continually and inspecting what you do and thinking about how you do that and trying to do it better it's the pursuit of excellence over time that i think is important and we'll talk about sustainability as a topic i think it runs through this excellence theme the whole day Exactly. So, so we all seem to sort of agree. So, which is sort of unusual because those conversations on Friday were quite different. But you know, we will probably find a few a few questions where we sort of disagree. So, um, I actually announced the the stream. Um, actually, I stole it from from you, Johannes. Um, and and you know, it starts off with the announcement. The abstract starts off with, "Are you uh, whatever what was it like level four, level ten, whatever engineer level." For me, it would be, are you a level four UJS engineer? I think that's that's the example that you gave. And I have to admit, and you already said that, that this is somehow weird. Why would I say that this is a level four engineer? To me, it's always sound, it, it almost sounds like like a role-playing game. So why do we have, you know, it's it's not a four, level four cleric, but it's a level four UJS engineer. So why do we have, why do we think that this makes some sense? Well, the question actually was, are you a level 10 engineer, Eberhard? Are you? Spring Boot, are you level 10 at Spring Boot? I mean, you've got recognition on that from the outside and you haven't done it for a long time, I bet. But So to be perfectly honest, um, I con don't consider myself an engineer. I'm a consultant, which is quite different. And uh, I stopped spring trainings a few years back for a reason. So and and that probably says. So you kind of you, you at some point in your career you might have been a level ten engineer in Spring Boot, but you kind of drifting backwards now. So the question, well, <laughs> before we started off saying what is junior or professional or or lead or senior or, or principal at Xing, they call them principals. Um, in our discussions, we we really get didn't get too warm with these levels and we realized that this is also something that companies would have to decide themselves how they actually want to do it. But we came up with a leveling scheme for skills and we said we could collect skills and then we could rank them. And the idea in the document now is that we rank them from zero to 10 or we put an X. If you don't have the skill, like I don't have any Kubernetes skills, so with me that would just be an X. Um, but zero would be indicate I don't have a skill at that, but I want to learn it. On Wednesday, when I gave the talk, I call it call it I want to be an idiot, and then ranks one to three. Originally, they were junior ranks. On Wednesday, I called them idiot ranks because when you start learning something, when I start learning Kubernetes, you guys will tell me I'm a pretty idiot at it. But of course, the aim is to leave at some point that level. Then we have this levels four to six. Always remember, this is a proposal. You don't need to do it like that. But levels four to six would be something like I'm a user. 
I'm a user of Git. I know how to use Git. But I'm not an expert at Git. Every time this message with a two-headed snake or hydra comes along, I, I'm kind of lost and I better get to an expert to help me. Level seven to nine, we would consider expert in something with, with variations of expertise. And then, I, then we thought, there is a level 10. You have exceptional people at some things. But I always thought maybe this is a skill that you don't solely get by working in a company. But this is something if you contribute to open source or if you um, go and give talks or lectures on things or if you publish something like you have been an expert, you would, would, you would be at level 10, I'm pretty sure, at Spring Boot because you wrote books about it. It couldn't all have been hybrids. You must have known something. Actually, that book I wrote before there was such a thing as Spring Boot, so it's really about Spring Framework. But those are details. So, Rob, why do we why do we want to have those levels? Um, so for me, people normally complain I'm too loud, so I keep it right. No, no, you, not you, should, you should really <laughs> put it as close as possible. Okay. Um, so when I when I read what Johannes wrote, he wrote the initial levels were junior and then. Um, senior engineer and then a professional. professional and then senior and then staff engineer and for me i see that a lot in organizations where you have these like five levels and they have labels attached with them and i look at it and go well that as human beings we're labeling machines we label everything we put everything in boxes because it's easy to deal with but i think that's very limiting uh, to people and in some ways like how would you feel if you're told oh you're a junior engineer and if you've got 25 years experience in doing something and you come into engineering and it's the first time you start developing, you get called junior, I think that's unfair to that person. Um, it also means that um, only having four or five levels or uh, like banding or grading as an engineer, if you think about your progression, as you get further through your career, like the feeling of growth and progression slows from the, the title, once you get to like a senior or a staff engineer, like where do you go from that? Like what's the next 10 or 15 years of my career look like? There's no, there's a, there's a reduced sense of progression there. So thinking about a leveling scheme, it means that there's uh, a much wider range of growth there. So it's more fine grained. You have the ability to feel like you're progressing more through your career. And instead of having a label of, and, and with that label comes some sort of, like if you're sitting in a room with someone and there's a junior engineer and there's a senior engineer, the senior engineer is normally the one that has the loudest voice and the most input and the ability to decide on things. But the levels make it, it gives it more flexibility and it, it allows people to interact in a more, um, in a less, I'm more senior than you, therefore I tell you what to do or I know more than you. It gives a bit more flexibility. But it also with the skill levels that you were talking about, Johannes, I think the skill levels on top of this overall what we call a career level is important because that allows the uh, someone who is less like they're, they're less overall senior in their career but they might have more deep skills in a certain area it allows them to be able to contribute in a more natural way Which yeah i like that with the skill levels i was reminded of an engineer we hired at xing at the age of 17 christopher christopher is now doing language tools i mean he's a entrepreneur he's done different things he's a brilliant front-end engineer but he was very young and he didn't know any pearl i think we did pearl at that time or ruby on rails at that venture but he was brilliant in javascript he was absolutely brilliant at the age of 17 18 so so what i took away from from those discussions that we had on the friday so the the idea that i took away which i found interesting is so here is a person and that person would have a skill in whatever it is, like Vue.js, that's the example that we had. And that person would have a skill of six, whatever that means. Now, this seems to be something that is, and we all seem to agree that it's somehow, well, hard and, you know, doesn't really feel great. But the advantage is that we could now say, okay, this person, even though it's an engineer that is considered a junior, will take responsibility for the front end because obviously the skill level is higher. And therefore, if the senior says we are going to do it this way, 
the junior can still say, no, we are going to do th it this way because it's my expertise and this is what actually my role is in this project. I'm going to be have responsibility for that. And I thought that was quite interesting. The other thing, and, and you mentioned that, so you would also have junior and senior are, again, two, two sort of levels, and you would have probably more fine-grained levels. And that's the other thing that, that I took away. Um, oh, by the way, we should probably say that this is something, at least Rob says, it is something that, that they use at Google. So uh, the other thing that I took away is that a level 5 engineer is paid in the same range as a level five manager, which I found interesting. So it basically says, well, you're contributing because you're an engineer and you're contributing because, well, you're a manager. But, you know, we sort of compare them to one another and then you can still say, okay, you're a level five engineer, whatever that means. And there is a level two engineer and that person has that high level in Vue.js. So that person will have responsibility for that area of expertise and you will have responsibility for a different area of expertise because you're an expert on what is it, Kubernetes or something. So if there is a meeting, it's actually quite clear and it's about front end, it's actually quite clear that the level two engineer with the Vue.js expertise is the person who will do, who will uh, have the, str uh, the, the most impact there and the other person maybe doesn't even take part because, you know, Kubernetes front end, no relation. So um, I see a lot of companies that um, as you progress in your engineering career, in order to progress further, you get, as you, once you become senior, in order to progress further, you're almost forced to become a manager. Like there is engineering up to a certain point, and then in order to grow more, more money, more responsibility, more accountability, you're suddenly a manager. And therefore, you have to look after people. You'd have to grow them. You have a team of people to look after. Um, and the thing that made you good at being an engineer, suddenly you need to learn an entirely new set of skills. And the thing that you really you enjoy doing, the coding, the engineering, the developing, pushing code, um, you get way less of that. And um, from a sustainability point of view, the people that know the most about the system, how to develop, what the system does, how to think about it on a much wider scale, they suddenly are doing less of that. And so you lose like the, their ability to help support the system and grow it and to grow the people that work on it becomes way less. Um, part of being a manager, and someone spoke about too many meetings, part of becoming a manager often means going to meetings. It also means making decisions about things. And for me, there should be an option for people, uh, for engineers that want to remain engineering. They should be able to grow within the organization because having those people around for 10, 15, 20 years that's something that allows you to bring junior people in. They can coach and mentor the junior engineers in a way that makes it sustainable. So it's a, it's a longer-term sustainability for the health of your code base. Yeah, I think that's something interesting, a, a short argument, which is quite punchy when we discussed our, in our Friday meetings, is if a company would not have an expert career, then an expert who at some stage in his career builds a house and wants to pay it off or something, wants to earn more money or get more recognition, would have two choices only, namely become a manager or change the company. In any case, the company loses a good engineer. So um, that's, that's, I find, a pretty strong argument for companies to look more into expert careers. And that is actually happening. Companies do that. But I think there are pretty many companies in Germany who are still quite traditional in their career path. Yeah, and and I think it's quite radical that uh, the managers and the engineers get sort of the same uh, payment rate at, at Google. So there is a question in, in the chat uh, by Fabauti on, on Twitch. And he says, maybe I'm reaching ahead, but what are the levels for anyway? Doesn't every label lead to preconceptions how do they help in becoming excellent? And, I mean, we discussed what they are for, so I think that's sort of done. But I think the question about how do they, how do they help us to become excellent, that's actually a good question, right? An excellent question, even. Um, so so to, to address the question, um, if, you're, if you work in Google 
uh, and I know some of you are asking, yeah, but we're not Google, how would we ever do this here? We'll come back to that later. Um, when you're in Google and you sit in a room, there isn't a talk of what level you are. The leveling, the career level, is about your own personal development. It's about a sense of growth and having the ability to feel like you progress through your career. When you're sitting in a room with a team of other people, you're all engineers. You all have skills in different areas, and therefore you're all able to contribute in a more open way. There isn't a sense of, I'm senior, so I'm going to lead this meeting. Like anyone can do that. Uh, and did that answer the question? Yeah, I would have an addition to that. And because I thought maybe we should briefly go back to why would we actually talk about levels at all? And I think we did that in the previous, in the preparation talk. Is I think a big part of the why is give feedback, make uh, produce a system that gives feedback to people. Because if you don't have feedback, it's hard to learn. Any any system or any person or anything that wants to learn needs feedback. Now, if you don't care for feedback then it will be hard for people to learn. So in order to become a learning company, I think uh, feedback helps. And maybe you can say something about the uh, feedback and the safety thing, but that came from you. Let, let, let's let's stick to the question for, for a second, because I thought that sort of the obvious answer would be, uh, well, because we are, we you know, every individual knows what level they are at, it helps them to see where they can improve. And maybe even there is, you know, there could be a plan based on that information to uh, help them improve. And, you know, how how would I become excellent if uh, I'm not sure what my sort of current state is? And uh, how would I learn anything if, if I don't know the, the level that I'm at? Or, you know... I could probably do that myself, but if someone wants to help me, then this information is actually it is actually something that is that is worthwhile. So to me, it seems like the obvious answer, but you gave a different one. So do you disagree, or is it a good point, or do you think the two of you? Well, maybe we are not. For me, the why is pretty clear. Then that's the feedback thing. So, yeah, but but how does it help to become excellent? Okay. One of the ideas in the document is that you don't give feedback once, but you, but you implement this on a regular base. Um, in, if you have employees and you're a manager, line manager for employees, you could care for giving feedback like once a year formally or maybe every six months formally. Now, I've seen companies where employees didn't get any feedback for two years or three years. So I always wonder... Is, is nobody taking care or are people afraid of giving feedback? Because feedback is kind of hard. I mean, it's not easy. Yeah. By the way, my feedback for us would be, I think we currently suck at answering the question. I'm not sure. Maybe the, the answer that you're giving is, well, it's really about feedback and not so much about a a levels that allow us to become yeah, excellent. Yeah. yeah. Um, so around the levels uh, and around feedback, and you talked about not getting feedback for two years. Once you reach the level of a senior engineer, it's a big band. I mean, that's a, that's a band that can cover four, five, six years of your career. And the description for that will be maybe one paragraph of a list of responsibilities. And so it's very hard to feel like you're progressing there because it's like there isn't that fine-grained feeling of, okay, to, in order to, to have that growth, to have clear expectations around how to move, like how to progress. Um, because it's it's just it's open. You can work on any of those things, but the leveling system and having more levels allow you to more precisely um, know what it is that you need to do next and what to work on. It gives you more guidance, and that means that the the feedback that you can get and the the information you need to grow can be specific, like more specific and uh, more beneficial for for progressing. So there is a question from the audience. We have two. So, so the, the question was, how do we think about grading and how do you implement grading? Um, well, if you look at the skill matrix that we propose, the idea would be um, that the company sets out and our suggestion would be 0 to 10. 
set some grades for skills. We could do that in teams or talk to people, but then have a, a, a grading system on the skills. And you can add skills to your matrix. It's just, you know, you can, over the time, a person, well, I would have my skill matrix and it says Vue.js is one of the things where I know something at. Probably I'm at a level three to four. That's just leaving the idiot level or something like that. And then we talk about that each half year and somebody would give me feedback on that. Now the question would be, could that be a line manager giving the feedback? What I liked from primary school from my daughter a lot was that first I give myself feedback. So I do, I do a self-estimation. Like if you have some somebody who applies at a company, you won't get any external feedback on that person. But the person could still do the self-assessment and say, well, I think I'm level five at Python or something like that. And if you do regular talks, then you could probably take one or two people from the team the person works in to give feedback on that. that would, so you would have also an external view. That's interesting. Then you see how do you self-assess yourself? How are you being viewed in the system? And then Eberhard always says, and, and then you could give hints. Stop this or keep this. You're really good at that. Keep that. And then you could note it down and say, okay, we, we talked now the 30th of September. I think it is today. Hannes, uh, stop using view two. Look into view three or stop answering questions stupidly, do this and that. Okay, okay that's, uh, that's maybe bad. But you, you write that down, and then half a year later, you could review that yourself or together and estimate that. Now, these are skills. These are not career levels. A company would then probably be wise to somehow match these skills to career levels and decide what do we call well, junior. When do you actually leave your junior state? How do you become senior? At Xing, we always said, you become senior at Xing. You don't start off as senior. You, you know, you, you enter here as something, and then we decide at some point whether you're senior or not. Well, that is up to the company how to do that, whether you want to introduce principal. If you have a lead or a principal or whatever you call it, the super role in the engineering, I think I would expect that a person with that role would have at least one or two or three skills at expert nine or ten level. Um, so I would implement it that way. Uh, when I worked at Otto, Otto had a very formalized way of looking at people. They called it the LUP, the Leistung und Potenzialgespräche, once a year, and it was firmly established in the SAP HR system. So all we line managers have to get up and think about all the people that reported to us and categorize them. And you had a matrix with potential and um, achievements, something like that. And then you had quadrants. And my aim, I mean, that's quite brutal in a way, but my aim was to move people up, always move them up. And if they, don't, if they weren't movable in an upwards direction, we might have to consider to demote them or to get rid of them. You know, that's tough, but it's a feedback system, and it achieved at least that I, as a manager, had some sort of idea on who I work with. Personally, now I like the skill matrix a lot better, because you could also do things like look at the team and see, now let's look at all the skills we have in our team. Is there anything we lack? Is there anything we excel at? So being a high-energy physics by education guy, I like data evaluation, so I just love the idea of getting like 100 skill matrices and just look at all the statistics and do stuff like that. But I think, coming back to the why, this, this is all nice, but I think if you want to have an excellent organization, it needs to be about learning and about improving basically the IQ of the whole organization. And for that, feedback should help, I think. So I wanted to say something about your first question. You asked, like, how do you, how do you grade people. Um, normally in companies, it's the manager that decides, right? There's a calibration process and managers take feedback and then they decide. But managers often aren't so close to the people doing the work. They don't understand what the engineers are doing. They've, they've got six people that they manage. They spend their time doing one-to-ones and, and uh, meetings and other stuff. 
Um, and therefore, for me, in order to, especially from an engineering point of view, knowing how you're contributing to a project and like the quality of your code and the architecture and the way that you reason about things, the way that you work with other people, that has to be a peer gr a group of your peers that helps contribute to that. That peer group needs to take feedback from a wide range of people, including the manager, because that's part of the, how that works. But if it's left solely with the manager to decide, then it encourages the people that report to the manager. And the manager can decide, hey, I hire you, I fire you, I decide what you get as a bonus or pay. Anywhere where that can happen, like it encourages people to tell the boss what he thinks to hear. It, it creates this, hey, look, I'm, I'm not able to give I'm, I'm worried if I give direct feedback to my manager that he's going to somehow like not give me the bonus that I deserve. And so it has to be a peer group that, that, that does that uh, process. And your second question was, so this is where I think you need a range of feedback. I mean, if you ask feedback from your customers, you get this massive range. And there's like one person can have one bit of feedback that's immensely powerful. And you can have 100 people say the same thing that has way less impact. And it, in this regard, depends like all feedback is valuable but you have to calibrate that to understand okay is the thing that this person is saying is that important i don't think that someone that has less experience in a thing commenting on it should be just automatically treated as therefore less valuable it has to be taken on the merit of what they say well i, I think in the preparation talk we already also touched the subject on you can give well, Eberhard asked the question, what if you don't have a feedback culture in your company or if you don't have a formalized way to do that, you could still try to get and open yourself to feedback in your team or in your group or close to your peers. And that comes maybe to, to the question, who can give feedback? Is it only managers who can give feedback? And I th clearly think no. Probably everybody could give feedback, yet Giving feedback is kind of hard. I mean, it's always nice if you comment on the nice sides and you say, well, that was really great. Keep doing that. Or uh, Even if you suggest, I have a suggestion, that's a bit more difficult. But what if you really are in some sort of conflict with the outcome of somebody's work? Uh, they are more difficult. The feedback can also be difficult. And personally, I like very much the TED talk by Kim Scott on that. Um, it's called Radical Candor. It's like a 15 minutes talk. And from what I remember from the talk, it's pretty much if you give feedback, it should be direct and it should be empathic. Uh, you should have empathy giving feedback. And then it's kind of good feedback. If you kind of empathic, but you're not direct, then you just circumvent issues. If you uh, direct, but you're not empathic, then you're basically brutal. You just kill people. And if you're neither of the two, then you kind of suck all together as feedback giver. Are we still on the internet? Or are we still on? Yeah, so so I'm afraid we had some audio problems that, uh, uh, that I was able to fix now. So we lost some audio. So I will publish a video with all the audio um, on, on YouTube. I think I should be able to do that because I have an extra audio um, uh, uh, recording, so sorry about that. Um, Can I just follow up on what Johanna said? Yeah, sure. And we also have a question in the audience here. Um, when we talk about this feedback and it linked to grading, like most companies, they do that once a year, and the feedback goes to the manager or the peer group, not to the person that, that, that like you get some anonymized feedback and it normally it's about stuff that happened like when you that happened during the year but when you get that at the end of the year and then you get told oh, i was a result of this thing 3 months ago by the way now you're not going to get your pay rise or you're not going to get the promotion you wanted it's like that that's not particularly helpful to the person the feedback needs to be at the time so that they can do something with that that they can develop um and so the feedback at the end of the year should have been given to the person through the year and then you can see the development of that person. Hey, the person got this feedback three months ago, and this is what they did to become better at that. This is the, the pursuit of excellence and the, the growth and the, the learning from it. Yeah, so... There's a question here in the audience. Excellent, go ahead. Yeah, so, so, so let me repeat the question. So the question is, uh, why are we having 10 levels? And uh, wouldn't it make sense to have like a different scheme and 
you know, sometimes there are, it's it, it's probably more complex. But on the other hand, those those are quite a few levels. So why those levels? It's just a proposal. You can have you're leveling your system yourself. You can just divide the levels by two and just chunk out all the odd number. Well, the, the numbers that have something behind the comma. Um, why it's ten in our case is. We wanted to have something that somehow resembled junior, professional, senior. So one to three, four to six, seven to nine. Then some people, I think Vincent suggested, he he has heard that companies have sub-levels on three, on their three junior levels and three senior levels or whatever. So that can be done on a scale from one to ten. Well, if you take these three... What I particularly liked about this idea is that the zero, if you have like feedback talks annually, the zero says something like, I want to be an idiot, a newbie. I want to learn this. And it indicates on your on your feedback sheet that this is something we want to pick up. So I'm contemplating learning Kubernetes, but yesterday evening by, at the beer, I was convinced that maybe that's not such a good idea. So maybe I pick something else, like uh, Kotlin or so, I don't know. And the other range of the scale i like the idea that there's an extra level that is not that cannot be given by actions in the company solely that that has some outer recognition um some extra thing that you do um that that is that leaves the tellerant of the company so to speak Actually. but that's just my liking you know you can do whatever you want but it's just a suggestion if you don't want to think about it just carbon copy it and suffer from the fine graded levels <laughs> so so here's my take so i would actually agree that this is a good question and um it reminds me about what i do about uh, stuff that happens to me as a trainer also if if i'm at a conference so you know you get a rating so the rating says you're a 10 or a 9 or whatever and um i have to admit that i think the reason why we have these kinds of ratings is to figure out whether someone is a good trainer or not and and whether you want to hire that person again and you know it's it's probably about career levels in a way the feedback that i find more interesting and better is the one that is is th this very simple format about try keep and try so here is stuff that you did good it, that you did well in the that training or whatever it is you should keep it And here is something to try out. And I like it because it actually says these are some actionable items. Like it's stuff that you can actually try out. And it actually says you can try them out. It's not like you have to do it. So um, I think I can relate to that. And I think I, I my guess would be, but maybe Rob has, has a different idea. My guess would be that this is also to set up teams. So if you have a team that is all... Um, you know, level eight engineers, and they are specialized in in Vue.js. Probably, it, and you know, the task really is about everything, not just Vue.js. Then you're doing something wrong. So I probably I believe that this might be the reason for it. I'm not sure. What do you think, Rob? Um, I think that uh, like you need diversity in order to have creativity and innovation, and uh, like that. If you have all people that are all at the same range and all of the same background and way of thinking, it's very, there's not much growth there. You can't learn much from each other. There's, it limits the amount of uh, growth and innovation. And so having um, diversity, both in terms of, of, of all the different aspects, uh, I think is really important. And that includes having a different range of people too. So can I, there's, there's two things. Uh, so the, the 10 is an arbitrary number. It's not four or five, which is quite a small range. And if you have 10, sure, you have to go through and have a really good, very clear description of how to get from one level to next. And maybe that's too much. In Google, they have, uh, I think, six or seven levels. They start at level three, and it goes up to level nine. Nine would be a, a Google fellow. There's like one engineer, basically, at that level. But there's more levels for you to progress through. And it also means that the levels between engineering and management are the same. You can be a level six manager and a level six engineer And you're, you're equivalent in terms of recognition and reward. There's a band there for both of those two things. So it allows engineers to progress through without having to be forced to become a manager. Well, 
does that i mean is it is does that answer your question i mean if you said okay we've got six here is that okay or if you want to score that I, I just also wanted to mock rob if google has a three to nine grading system i would say they have to 10 scale but they just skip the idiots so, so the, we, the, we have the, two the, questions. The, in the sorry, audience. the the additional the additional question was that if you have ten skills and they go from one to ten, then you actually have a hundred sort of skill levels, and that is actually something that I find interesting. So, is there really a connection to it? I mean, just because I'm a level eight engineer, does it mean that I would need to have some technical skill at that level? Well, we always talk about T-shaped people that we want to have. Now, nobody is truly T-shaped. Some people are pie-shaped or whatever, or tripod-shaped, or some are just saucers. I don't know. Uh, some are just nails. Um, but in reality, with a skill matrix, you could look at that. You could have more and more skills, and you'd build them out uh, through levels. I want to also mention that it's not only technical skills we thought about, but also communication skills, beyond tellerandic skills, stuff like that. So, yeah, I think what we need to really do is we tr we, sh we should try it out. And then if it doesn't work, we should adapt or we should enhance. So we have questions, and you said questions go first. Yeah. And there was one back there, and it was actually before you. I can see that. You need to trust me. Okay, the question was whether it's grades or levels. We haven't been too precise with the terminology here. And the second question was whether the individual skills might be too specific if we say something like Nuxt 2, for example. Now, if you want a Nuxt 3 expert, you would not want Nuxt altogether or whatever. So whether this would be then too finely graded. Um, the one thing we learned when, when we started this, also here at Shibo, is that I went to some engineering teams and I asked them, what are your basic skills that you need to work here? And you just yesterday mentioned we, we, we left out HTML and CSS, and this was like a face palm. Yes, we should put them in there as well. But with these basic skills, if you write them down, you could then go to people who want to, who apply here, and when you interview them and dish out the sheet and they can fill it out and maybe that helps in the application process. So it's kind of dynamic, I would say. Yeah, so so from my perspective, why am I excited about this? I'm excited about this because it means that I can set up a team and I can have an expert that is a junior and that person would still have a role that is very important in one specific area of expertise because he is really, they they are really the person who knows that stuff best. So that's the result that I want to get. And I think that's important and interesting, right? Because otherwise there might be a situation where you say, where, where that person that is really an expert on something kind of gets overwritten by some senior who happens to be a senior but doesn't really know anything about that technology. So I think that is an, an outcome that we are looking for. And uh, the other thing that I found interesting is how you can compare managers to engineers. How you, you basically say, okay, same thing you're just doing so it's there is a sales range and uh, it doesn't really matter whether you're a manager or whether you're an engineer um, there is some some sort of bandwidth concerning the the payment range and i personally don't really feel that comfortable about those levels and i think i'm not sure i mean the introduction also also said that maybe it's it's a shared uh, feeling so i wouldn't stick to those levels to me important what is important to me is that I get um, that juniors can be empowered to be more, to, to take responsibility for what they can really take responsibility for. That's the one thing. The other thing, and I don't really think that we discussed that, but that is also something that I learned in, in the discussion that we had beforehand. There is just so much that you can progress. So, you know, I'm a Spring Boot developer. And I become better at Spring Boot. And I become better at Spring Boot. And I become better at Spring Boot. But at one point, I'm actually judged by whether I can influence other people. So whether I can help them, whether I can show them the way around. That's the other thing that I found interesting. And if you can achieve those outcomes, in my opinion, I would be fine with any other way to do that. Because I personally don't really feel comfortable about le the levels either. So that's what we just discussed. And also the other thing is we are talking about Google, right? 
Google has, what is it? 10,000, 20, like an enormous amount, uh, number of engineers. They probably get some benefit by saying, okay, this is how our, what our workforce looks like, right? So, because there are so many people. I'm not sure whether I would introduce, and that might be a reason why they have those levels, and I'm not sure, you know, th there is this thing that we often forget about. Google is just on a very different scale from anything else, like like at least my clients. Of course, there are other companies at the same scale. So I'm not sure whether I would just blindly accept those things. It's just that I think there are interesting things that they are doing and that I think lead us to better results. And we should learn those. I'm not sure whether I would follow them in detail because, I mean, even setting up that thing that says, okay, so what's, you know, that discussion, what's the difference between level six and level seven? Going to be an interesting discussion. Um, we started out this talk, it's about excellency. And through this, we've talked about giving feedback. And for me, the levels and the grading is great. It's interesting, but feedback it, for me is at the heart of what allows us as people to work with other people more effectively, to talk, to deal with problems. And when you can do that, you can overcome every, anything, and it helps with our personal growth. And if we want to talk about being excellent, feedback is at the heart of it. And giving feedback is immensely difficult. Like, as human beings, we have this fight or flight reaction. Like If someone says, I'll give you an example, a conversation I had with someone the other day. I was having a conversation, and the person said, hey, stop shouting at me. And I'm like, I'm not shouting at you. It's like... <laughs> and I, I heard myself saying it. I'm like, ah, this person's trying to tell me something. But getting that feedback is really hard. Uh, if someone says, hey, that thing that you, the presentation that you gave yesterday, hmm, not so great. I thought it was this. Like it, it, it comes to the heart. Like it's, it's like you're being attacked, right? And therefore, it's very hard to take that. And if you can get good at an organization, as people, as teams, as an organization, and giving, giving and receiving feedback and actually doing something with that. I think for me, when I look at companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon and Netflix, that's actually at the core of what allows them to work more effectively. The grading and the leveling is great. It's, there's a scheme there to support growth. But in terms of actually building that excellence and the heart of the culture, that the culture of feedback and candor and the creating the psychological safety and the setting for people to be able to do that without feeling, feeling fear of retribution or being made to look stupid, I think that is the core of a culture of a company. And if as a company you can focus on doing that, everything else will follow. Right? That's the, the thing. Um. Yeah. There was another question from the audience. Yeah. So um, one question was, um, so who would, uh, could engineers also give uh, feedback? I think that's, that's the core of the question. And there was another question that I don't seem to be able to recall. Oh yeah, about about the soft skills. Yeah, yeah. So so the other thing is uh, whether this also works for soft skills because soft skills are also the the thing something that is that is very important. So given the time, maybe if I I'll pick up on the if I can pick up on the topic of uh, like is it like can engineers give feedback? Uh, for me, everyone should be able to give feedback to everyone else. You take Netflix as an example. The employees are able to tell the CEO, even in the middle of him presenting to 400 people, hey, uh, I don't think people are really getting it, or the thing you said was really disrespectful. Uh, that's, and it's the CEO that's encouraging that way of doing it. But as an individual, uh, you have to model the behavior you want to see from others. As an individual, you can actively go to people and say, hey, can you give me some feedback? I'd really like it. Like inviting people to be able to give it to you makes it okay to do that. You can also ask people, hey, uh, I've got some feedback for you. Can I give it to you? Like asking for permission to do that. Um, and then making sure that when you give people feedback, you let them know where you're coming from. Hey, I noticed you're doing this thing. I'd like to give you the feedback because I think there's something you can learn and develop. And it's about the, the growth and the, the feedback. And that intent helps people take like take that feedback and to be able to do it. So to say, I think actively asking for it encourages other people to then do that. And actually, I mean, we've been talking about technical skills a lot because it seems to be easy, you know? Um, when we started out with the skill matrix, we had like, I think, seven or six categories of, you know, and only one of them was technical. And, uh, of course, there was communication skills, leadership skills. I don't recall all of that. 
I hope it's in the document, so check it out. And if you don't like it, just uh, you don't even have to do a pull request. Currently, the GitHub repo directs you to a Google Doc, so you can just click the link and write in it if you want. Yeah, so definitely look at that. In the feedback, you mean is is actually what a person so, so wants to achieve uh, uh, one of the categories we have in the document. I'm actually not sure. Yeah, and and uh, the, the same impulse basically was that um, in large tech companies there are there's a huge variety of, of careers that you can train take, and oftentimes this is not the case for uh, companies that uh, people work at. So uh, it becomes somewhat complicated, and maybe there is the, the well, that's not really what, what the statement was. But one way out of that would be to sort of more steer towards one direction and uh, give the people the opportunity to to rather go into that direction. Um, and my answer to that statement actually would be, more often than not, that discussion doesn't even happen. So what do you want to do? Where do you want to grow? What is it that you want to achieve? What about this? Why don't you do this? And I mean, at the end of the day, my personal, I mean, there, there are quite a few things that I can do. So, you know, uh, I can actually develop software, but I chose to do something different. And there is there are some reasons for that. One of the reasons is because uh, it is something that, that uh, I, I enjoy. And also it's because I can actually do it. And that is that is, in my opinion, something that a job is about. It's not about I do I just do what I enjoy. That's you know that's also my hobbies. Hob my hobbies are also stuff that I enjoy. But it also has to be something that you know makes me money in some way. And therefore, I'm I. How shall I put it? I have to to compromise. I would argue. So if I want to stay with that company and that company has. If I, I I really want to to do something that this company doesn't provide me. I need to go somewhere else, and that is something that I actually did in some in some cases in in my career. But chances are that there is something that you still would enjoy, and that is actually interesting to the company, and you should have that conversation. I think that's the point. At the start, we spoke about one of the things, that one of the definite part of the definition for excellence is the ability to deliver. And so in the case of performance, if you can say, hey, look, I'm really interested in performance and you can see an opportunity for the company, hey, if we can make this bit of our shopping cart 20% quicker, I think we can capture like, you know, 1% uh, more orders. There might be a financial reason that the company says, hey, you know what, actually, that's a great idea. Let's go do that rather than let's build this logging system that actually doesn't have the same impact. And so it's like these other companies, Google and Facebook and these like mega companies, they judge people based on their ability to, to impact the company. That's the delivery part of it. And so here you can take the thing that you're interested in, but it has to be around the ability to deliver for your company. Like this is about making your company win. I don't, I'm not sure I like the word win or lose, but that like you're, you want to be successful as a company. That's why we're here. And so that ability to deliver has to be within the context of success at the company. How are we doing for time, Eberhard? Yeah, actually, we don't really have any time left. So, but there was one thing that we we really, I mean, like forty minutes, seconds or so. But there was one thing that we really wanted to to at least shortly discuss, and that is like, what can we do in our companies? Because some things like you know introducing such skill levels uh, is something that we probably you can't really do at home. And my takeaway was this stuff about feedback. Um, that is important and you can start to give feedback right away. You should, and what, what I learned in all those conversations is that feedback is actually, well, the hardest thing probably. And to me, that this means two things. So one thing is I actually have to think about that and, you know, get some skills about that. So that's one thing. And the other thing is if it doesn't really work out, well, it doesn't work out for other people either, so don't be afraid and just try to improve and do it again. So, And that is something that you can basically start right away. Um, maybe a tweak on that. Rather than giving feedback, ask for feedback. And ask and right. do that from a range of people and do it regularly, weekly, to try and get that. That's the thing that will help you to grow, the, grow the most. And you can do that on your own without asking for permission from anyone. There's no one that can't tell you to do that. 
Um, so, and if everyone started doing that, the culture would naturally change, right? Overnight, you would start to give feedback because you know people are looking for it. And therefore, the culture on its own will change. So, I think that's pretty much it. So, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for uh, all the questions here in the audience. And uh, thanks a lot also for, for the questions and the, the comments in the stream. And, uh, yeah, I hope this was enjoyable. Thanks, Eberhard. Thank <laughs> you.